Well, hi everybody, welcome back to IndyCar with me, Gordon Ross. I'm in car just in the back lane this evening. Now, as you know, I don't normally make a lot of videos um, in the evenings. So usually when I make a video in the evening, it's for a particular purpose. And tonight, I think, um, probably for a very important purpose, which is to try to, well, to try and stop all the warring and the factional infighting that's going on at the moment. And to be honest with you, um, having been a part of the factional infighting myself and having been accused of having even started some of the infighting myself, I think it's up to me to try to calm things down a bit as well, since um, I am partly responsible, at least for fanning the flame, shall we say. So what do I want to talk about? Well, you may have noticed today that um, in the Glasgow Herald, there was an article about uh, Robin, uh, what's his name, Robin McAlpine from Commonweal. Now Commonweal, if you don't know about it, is a very um, well run and extremely um, creative think tank, political and philosophical think tank uh, based in Scotland. And Robin McAlpine is one of its um, leading lights, if not the leading light in it. And they come up with fantastic ideas for the future of the country, the way it should run, how things could be done differently, how the social aspect of the country can be dealt with, how poverty could be eradicated, and so on and so on. Many, many great ideas have come out of Commonweal. And I am the first one to applaud them for just about everything that they've ever done. So it came as a great shock to me this morning when I read this article in which um, Robin was expressing his doubts about whether the current plans uh, for independence by the SNP and in particular uh, his, his doubts over whether Nicola was the right person to lead this uh, came out in the, the press today. Now of course the, the unionist newspapers like, like the Herald uh, were gleefully jumping on this and, and their headline basically was uh, to the effect that he had said fuck off or something to Nicola. And actually what they did was they lifted something out of his um, his um, his article in which uh, he paraphrased other people uh, when he said fuck off, basically, because this is the sort of thing that people do in the newspapers. They, they latch on to something which suits the narrative. However, uh, the fact that somebody as eloquent and as normally supportive as uh, Robin would come out in the press with something as critical as this it was unusual. And it's, it strikes me that now, I think Robin is probably about the fourth or fifth major uh, political commentator to come out and openly criticise the SNP. Now, before everybody jumps on me and says I'm Nicola bashing and I'm, I'm always going on about the negativity and I'm always trying to highlight negativity. No, I'm not. I'm just trying to highlight the reality, which is that a lot of people are feeling extremely worried at the moment about the lack of any urgency from the SNP and how they're planning to deal with what is coming next. Now, nobody for a moment is, is about to say, and least of all me, that the SNP should not have dealt uh, almost entirely with getting this COVID-19 virus under control and saving as many lives as possible. Nobody is saying that. Nobody is attacking Nicholas Sturgeon for that. In fact, nobody's tackling Nicholas Sturgeon at all here. Not me, anyway. But what is happening is, now that the COVID-19 virus, at the moment at least, is under control and has been basically minimised down to almost zero deaths, as, as close as can get at the moment. Um, they had a long period of seven or eight days there with no deaths, and one yesterday that I was reporting on on, um, on Scotland at seven. But the fact is now that that virus is under control, yes, there is a, a risk of things going uh, out of shape again in the autumn when the flu season starts up again. Winter bugs of all kinds tend to flourish uh, as the temperatures cool down. And that is probably going to happen with COVID-19 with the coronavirus because it's a virus and people catch it more in the wintertime for a number of reasons. However, um, that aside, there is a, a bit of a breathing space at the moment. And I don't imagine for a second that Nicola Sturgeon is not thinking about independence. She has had her hands full coping with the COVID-19 virus, which everybody knows about, and everybody who has a brain thinks that she's done brilliantly well and she has easily outshone and outperformed the, the rest of the United Kingdom. 
and that much is not in doubt. And I am also certain that Nicola Sturgeon has other people in her party and in the party, uh, the, sorry, in the uh, parliamentary party, whose job it is to deal with the independence question and to keep the pot boiling and to keep working towards it, not least of whom are guys like Ian Blackford and Pete Wishart, who interestingly have now become far, far more animated down in Westminster. Particularly um, recently Ian, Ian Blackford, who came out with a number of cryptic threats about how Scotland was not going to allow itself uh, to have its powers grabbed. So there are things going to happen, obviously. But the problem has always been, and uh, my, myself, I've said this numerous times since I started this blog back in 2015, as soon as I broke the story about the Edinburgh hub, not so much the fact that it existed, but the fact that it was poaching civil servants from under the noses of the Scottish government by secretly enticing them to job interviews and offering them higher salaries to work for the British government than for the Scottish government, I knew there was something wrong there. And when Mr Mundell was championing this vast open space and how it was going to contain 3,000 British civil servants, everybody started to wonder, well, why do you need 3,000 British civil servants in Scotland when we've already got a perfectly good civil service at Holyrood? And the answer to that is it's a, what would you call it, a Trojan horse. It's being built ready to take up uh, the cudgels as soon as... Uh, devolution is out of the way because Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings are not stupid. People belittle Dominic Cummings saying that he's only interested in video games and uh, manipulating data on screens. He's not. He's very much worse than that. He's a lot more dangerous than that. And he and the rest of the spads who organise and um, uh, who tell Boris Johnson and the rest of the Tory party what to do are basically planning to take Scotland over. I mean, they're, they're making no secret of the fact and they're not going to do it in just one move either. They have several different strategies all in play at the same time, the latest of which is this bizarre new legislation called the Internal Market Test Bill. And this is something that they have invented, like somehow or other, um, Britain is like the United States or the European Union and it has an internal market. Well, it doesn't have an internal market. It just has all of the people in the United Kingdom. And that is, for all intents and purposes, one uh, political entity. So there is no internal market. But it hasn't stopped them from inventing one so that they can use this so-called internal market test as a way of preventing any Scottish legislation which they don't like from becoming law. And that means if uh, the Scottish government were to say legislate for a referendum without um, without a Section 30 order, for, the, for example, if it went through this test, this so-called um, internal market test, and it was shown that it would adversely affect some other parts of the internal market, in other words, the rest of the United Kingdom's businesses, then they could say, oh, that's too big a risk. That can't happen. And this is just a way of basically hauling the reins in on a parliament, a Scottish parliament, which is already hobbled and hogtied and unable to move as it is. But it could delay independence and the referendum by years. And this is, of course, what the Tories want to do. They know that they cannot stop the Scots from having a vote eventually, but they can slow it down and they're going to slow it down as much as possible. If it and the, at the end of the day, the slowing down doesn't work, then they will simply abolish the evolution. And by doing that, they remove at a stroke political parties, the political party's uh, place of work, in other words, Holyrood, the place to debate things, to pass laws that make it possible for those parties to hold things like referendums or ballots, because a party cannot just hold a national ballot without it having to go through the Electoral Commission, which, guess what, is run by the British government, even though it's meant to be independent. It is a part of the British civil service. So we have all of these difficulties, and at the end of the day, I think Robin McAlpine and a number of other people have seen the writing on the wall that whatever the SNP tries to do in the most legitimate, legal and Let's face it, they're trying to be nice, they're trying to be fair, they're trying to play by the British rulebook in order to do things 
lawfully and legally. But we all know that that won't happen because, firstly, because the British government needs to negotiate a, a trade deal with the United States because it has no other trading uh, group at the moment. Once the European Union is over with, and it will be uh, on Hogmanay this year, once that's gone, they must do a big trade deal with somebody, uh, anybody at all. But the biggest, the biggest country that they could do a deal with would be America. And they've always leaned to America for everything. And there are already an awful lot of links between uh, British arms manufacturers, defence contractors and the Americans. That's been going on for decades since World War II. It won't change. But the problem is that the Americans will not do business with the United Kingdom where one part of the United Kingdom is about to split away. And it happens to be the one part that contains the American nuclear missile submarines. Right? So this is a strategic no-no for the UK and for the United States. Scotland cannot be allowed to leave Otherwise, you can't do a trade deal and the Americans will have nowhere to park their nuclear weapons, at least for a while. So they won't allow it. And because of that, no matter what the SNP tries to do, the British government will always be one or two steps uh, in front of them because they have to be. They have to head independence off at the pass all the time. The British are having to work very, very hard at the moment, firefighting in all sorts of different directions to keep the British uh, state together. It's it's flying apart at the moment. It's, it's spinning around and this centrifugal force uh, is pushing the countries apart. They're, they're trying mindfully to keep it together. But the main problem they have is with America. They will not get a trade deal if, if the United Kingdom starts to fracture or looks like Scotland is going to leave because it also removes a whole chunk of NHS contracts that the Americans would like to pick over and not to mention other nationalised industries or, or other industries uh, in Scotland which the Americans would love to get their paws on. So what I'm saying here is that Robin McAlpine, like many other commentators, Robin McAlpine, we've had Craig Murray, we've had, uh, who else? We've had um, Chris McElhinney, we've had um, Angus B. McNeil. There have been numerous people, all sorts of SNP figures are now leaving the party and wanting to set up other parties. Now, interestingly, the most recent person to leave the SNP, this uh, MP, Mr. Thompson, I forget his first name, He's leaving to set up something called the AFI, which is the Alliance for Independence. But this is a bit bizarre. The AFI already exists, and it was set up by Pat Lee, who um, everybody knows as, a, as an independence campaigner. Pat Lee and a number of other um, well-known independence campaigners set up the Alliance for Independence recently. And for Mr Thompson to come along and say he's setting it up uh, is a bit odd. So I don't really know what's happening there. Is he a part of the existing AFI or is this another AFI nobody knows about? I don't know. And then somebody else said to me today, well, there's another party starting up in December. I said, well, what, what's that one? And um, nobody seems to know. So the interesting thing that's happening at the moment is because of all these doubts and uncertainties about whether the SNP's plan is correct, and this has nothing to do with Nicola Sturgeon, by the way, this is just the fact that nothing much is happening at the moment and we're not getting any real indication of a plan or a direction of travel. People are getting really worried because they can see what's coming down the tracks. They know that the British government is about to stop any legislation that might allow us to have a referendum. They're going to not allow us a Section 30 order. They are going to perhaps at the end of all of this, uh, if they can't stop independence, eventually abolish devolution as a final uh, threat, a final way of stopping these Scots from escaping their clutches. All of these things are a reality, or they're a possibility. Now, people say, I remember Ian Blackford at, at a, a meeting one night, and somebody said to him, what will you do if um, they, they refuse a Section 30 order and abolish Holyrood? And Ian Blackford sort of spluttered because I don't think anybody had ever asked him that question before. And he recovered and the guy said, well, what would you do? And they said, well, um, I don't know. No, it's not going to happen, surely. That, that, they, they wouldn't dare do that, he said. wouldn't dare do that. And the guy said, well, what if they did? They said, well, we, we would have our uh, parliament behind a hedgerow if necessary. Because the fact would be there would not be a Holyrood to have any kind of government in. 
and basically Scotland would be being run by London directly. And I don't think they wouldn't do this. They've done it to Northern Ireland several times in its history. They would quite happily do it to us as well if it stopped us leaving. And when people say to you, oh, but that would never happen, they wouldn't dare do that. And, you know, that would cause a crisis. Well, of course it would cause a crisis, but they would win. And that's the whole point. So to those people, I would say, for those of you who say, well, that would never happen, they wouldn't dare. Well, think about it this way. The same sort of people were saying that we would never leave the EU. Donald Trump could never get elected to president of the United States. Boris Johnson had no hope. There's no way Boris Johnson was ever going to be prime minister. And, uh, you know, this is what you get. Everything that people thought couldn't happen since 2016 has happened now. We're out of the EU. Not only that, we're going to have no deal. We've got Boris Johnson as our leader. We've got Donald Trump doing it to do a deal with Boris Johnson over picking over our NHS and selling it all off. And uh, we're no nearer independence as far as I can see at the moment. But, and this is the great thing, is that the people of Scotland, despite all of this and all of this negativity, still want independence more than ever. We've now got 54% of the vote for independence. We can drive it up to 60. The question now is, will the Scottish government do something sooner than their initial plan? Do they have not a plan A, but a, a plan before plan A? Something that will happen before next May? I don't know. I have uh, been asked by people, you know, if I'm so clever, why don't I come up with a plan to get as independence? Well, I come up with three and I published them the other day. There are three possible ways of getting out of the clutches of the British government before they can use these draconian power grabs. And one of them would be to force an early snap general election at Holyrood right now, perhaps uh, by the Scottish government saying, well, if you're going to take over um, our parliament and de you know, declaw it by putting in this new piece of legislation, then that's not good enough. We're not going to, we're not going to stand for that. And they all resign at once, force a general election now, and then all of the independence parties, and I mean every single one of them, doesn't matter how small they are, and the SNP and the Greens, all get together and decide to announce that uh, whatever number of votes are cast for pro-independence parties added together, if that's greater than the votes cast for the unionist parties, then that is a clear majority for independence and we could declare it. That's one way of doing it. The second way would be to go through with the general election next May, as the SNP plans to do, but again make it a plebiscite election. Make it so that the number of votes cast in favour of independence parties over unionist parties, and they're quite clear to define, by the way, because despite the fact that 40% of the Labour Party wants independence, the party itself is anti-independent. So we can say, safely say the Tories completely anti-independence, the Labour Party anti-independence by its own uh, admission, and the Lib Dems anti-independence. So that's it. They are the opposition, and that is what we have to fight in a plebiscite election. It's not difficult. Chris McElhinney and Angus B. McNeil and now Joanna Cherry are all saying it's time to not just look at these ideas, but to put them into some kind of action plan. So if this happens, this is the plan. If that happens, we do this plan. We can have three or four different plans. Do you, do you think the British government has only one way of shutting down independence? You'd be mad to think that. They have dozens in their armory of ways of shutting us up, putting us back in our box and making sure that we do not escape. We need to be just as ruthless and we need to be just as imaginative the final way of getting independence was if the British government did shut down Holyrood and if uh, there was no other way of gaining independence, then the only thing we could then do would be just to stop cooperating with the United Kingdom completely and have a total, uh, basically non-cooperation, peaceful non-cooperation with anything British. You know, refuse to pay your taxes. That's always a good one. Um, refuse to work, to make money, to pay your taxes. I mean, okay, that costs you, but 
not working and not delivering things and not getting things done paralyzes a whole country. A go slow, a general strike. There are so many ways of doing this. Um, but also, I think the most important thing is if there is a threat to take away our independence or to prevent us from voting by inventing this law, which stops us legislating for a referendum, would be go, to go directly to the United Nations with it and say, we have a right to a vote on our, our own self-determination under international law and we want you to rule on this. And we want you to rule on whether the British government has illegally prevented us from exercising our democratic rights. And I'd be willing to bet you that the UN would say, yes, the British government is guilty of suppressing democratic rights and you have the right to hold your referendum and it should be recognised internationally. But it needs to be done. Uh, and I'm sure the SNP knows about all of these things. The question at the moment is, why are they not telling us that there are other alternatives? At the moment, it's all eggs in one basket. It's this ridiculous Section 30 order, um, gold standard so-called uh, methodology of gaining your independence. And people keep pointing out, as I have done as well over the past few years, no country gained its independence from the United Kingdom via the ballot box. And there's a good reason for that. And it's because you can't. It's because the British government won't let you. And it's because if you play by British, I was going to say British laws, if you play by English law, then you're you're mad because English law doesn't doesn't matter. Because if you're trying to secede, you're trying to separate yourself from a larger uh, country. And you're already a country anyway, by the way, so we don't have the Catalan problem at all. We have founding documentation. We have an actual constitution. There is no reason why we would have to obey the laws of the country that we are trying to get out of the clutches of, because that would be self-defeating. And that's why no country that has ever um, seceded from another has ever not broken that country's law to do it. You have to, because if you don't, you remain trapped. It's as simple as that. It's a basic circular logic. You cannot escape by following the laws of the country which is keeping you in thrall. And that is what's wrong at the moment. People don't seem to know that under international law, the British government cannot stop us voting. And even if we were forced to have the ballot in secret or to have the ballot conducted somewhere else, you know, by, by proxy, then we would do it. But we would have the support of the United Nations, but only if we make the request to them first. And that, I think, is the most important thing. I hope none of these things comes to pass. But the reason why so many well-known faces, and as I said, I was shocked when, when Robin McAlpine came out with what he said today, because he was very strong in his criticism uh, and unapologetic and use language I've never heard him use before. So he is obviously extremely frustrated and annoyed by this, that nothing seems to be happening and no action is being taken and there's no urgency in any of it. If the SNP has a big secret plan that, um, that they are trying to put into effect, which nobody knows about, then great. But... At the moment, nobody knows about it. And at the moment, the whole independence movement is in turmoil just now. People are fed up. They are sick and tired of being kept in the dark. And you can't blame people for feeling that way. Now is the time for all of us, and I mean me included, to pull together. And I have said, and I've said, I'll say this again, I supported the uh, Independence for Scotland party because I believed... And it still may be right that it would outlast the Alliance for Independence because the Alliance for Independence runs a diff slightly different model um, from the usual party model. And my feeling was that the ISP being much more of a normal party would appeal to voters because it has a much more normal structure and the people who uh, are being uh, put forward as candidates are being put forward as party candidates, not candidates who stand for something else but are under an umbrella group called the AFI, if you see what I mean. So the two different uh, organisations have different methodologies. However, I think before the end of this year, the parties have to merge into one 
either that or the Greens, the ISP, AFI and any other groups that spring up all need to get together and field candidates together because everybody says the one thing, you can't make sense out of it if there's too many parties, it dilutes the vote. When there was just two parties, it would be okay. Maybe even three if the Greens, the ISP, uh, sorry, the, the, yeah, the ISP and the AFI, the three of them could actually do okay because the Green vote tends to stay with the Greens. Uh, the SNP vote for people who want to put their vote somewhere else that where they know it will dislodge a unionist would be a good bet. And you would only have to get about 25% of the available SNP vote for one of those parties to be highly successful. But only if there's one of those parties. And I think by the end of this year, if one of the parties hasn't dropped out or if they haven't merged together into a bigger group, I might well give up on this idea because the idea, as far as I was concerned, was that one or two parties needed to emerge from this morass of small parties and this act activity in the list to pull together into one group or two large groups. But either way, not more than that, because once it gets bigger than that, then you're in trouble. So if other parties form and the vote starts to splinter and dissipate all over the three, and it will show up in the polls, incidentally, before the election. But if it shows in the polls that all of these new parties are polling very low, then there'll be no point in it. It will fail before it even starts. So the parties of the ISP and the AFI, they really need to talk to each other. I know there's bad blood between them already because um, there have been accusations that somebody from the AFI side was bad-mouthing the ISP and saying lies about them, spreading rumours about them. I don't know if that's true. This is hearsay. But whatever it is, um, party leaders need to be bigger than that. They need to see the bigger picture. And they need to talk with these other pro-independence parties and stop competing with each other. Because, well, life is about either competition or cooperation. If you want to win something or survive something, you have to cooperate. If, on the other hand, you are fighting a battle with your neighbours, then you don't need to do that. But we're trying to fight as a nation, as a huge group of people, against another nation, which is an even huger group of people. We're not going to beat them or beat their parties, their champions, if we're all so fractured and divided. So I'm hoping, hoping, that that will happen. I would love it if um, the Independence for Scotland Party and the Alliance for Independence would get together and form a common strategy, even if the if the two sort were glued together as separate groups, but they could uh, agree where to field candidates and where not to. So the identity of that party would be like one. They would both field candidates, but they would not field candidates where the other um, was. These things can be agreed. It, it's not impossible, but at the moment it's not happening and it needs to happen now. Anyway, that's all I have to say, really. It's a bit of a long-winded speech, I'm sorry. Uh, but there's a lot at stake. And the reason why people like Robin McAlpine had a rant today um, is because everybody is wound so tight. The stakes are very, very high. We have got everything to lose or everything to win. It's, it's that high a stake for Scotland. As far as the United Kingdom is concerned, they could lose their entire... Um, United States of America trade deal if we leave. And that's something we need to remember because it's a factor which isn't mentioned very much, but there's an enormous financial connection between London and Washington. And we mustn't forget that. Scotland, we tend to think of this in much more simplistic terms, but in geopolitical terms, the Americans need somewhere to park their nuclear missiles off the coast of Europe, somewhere near the north, so that they can threaten the Russians and uh, somewhere that's far enough off the coast of Europe that it would survive if Europe was taken over by the Russians, which honestly cannot see happening. The Russians admit themselves that they are they have about a tenth of the spending on um, on defence that America has. America's real enemy at the moment is going to be China, and they're already picking fights with China, as you've probably seen. So, as far as we are concerned, we need to remember that the British state wants a trade deal and they're not going to let Scotland go without a really, really big fight. 
and we need to have more than one plan. Probably three or four different plans, I think, um, because I can see various threads and trends in the way that the British state is organising itself against independence to stop it. Uh, and they are going to try and consolidate the United Kingdom into one um, homogenous group, which they control centrally from London. So there is no dissent when they go begging for scraps from the United States, because that's what this is really about. It's about keeping Britain together long enough to get a trade deal. It could well be that um, a deal could be struck with the United Kingdom to let Scotland go after the trade deal is done. But that would need to be done at a very, very high level. And I don't think that is anything that the SNP would want to tackle at the moment. And certainly, I'm not sure about you, but I wouldn't trust Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings as far as I could throw them in a deal like that one. Anyway, that's it for me tonight. Uh, as usual, if you have comments, don't be afraid to make them known. And if you have criticisms, make them as well. I'm always happy to answer criticisms. When people start calling me a traitor or a unionist or some other nonsensical name, just simply because I am criticising something, well, I think that's a bit childish, frankly, and a bit beneath you. So if you do want to criticise what I'm saying, fine. But I, I'm not going to call you names, so why call me names? Just because I'm pointing out a few weaknesses in our strategy. We need a stronger Scotland, and that means we need to all pull together. And all this fighting, the SNP says the end fighting is coming from the smaller parties. It's not. The smaller parties are a symptom of what is wrong with the SNP at the moment. That it is... I don't know, it's sort of like it's myopic. It can only see in one direction at the moment and it doesn't communicate with its supporters. That's a very, very bad thing to do. That's exactly what caused the Labour Party to lose all of its core vote in Scotland. They took it for granted. And I don't think the SNP can take the votes for granted this time. They really are going to have to do some work on convincing people that the strategies they have are going to work at the moment. We're hearing nothing about that. COVID-19, it's under control and it is time to start talking about the next steps for independence. It's not a bad word. The I word is not a taboo anymore. It has been for about the last three years. The SNP didn't talk about independence in public, especially not on the unionist media. But now is the time to start being a bit proud and to start saying we will talk about it and you're going to listen to us. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be in trouble. We need that now. We need that combative style. We're starting to hear some little signs of it from Pete Wishart, from, um, from Ian Blackford. And we're hearing a lot of encouraging signs from Joanna Cherry about the idea of looking at these alternative strategies. We need to look at all of these things. We cannot just simply carry on and hope for the best. This is what is wrong um, with the SNP at the moment. They demand absolute faith without giving any clue as to what we are asked to be faithful about or what the plan is. It's like waiting for the second coming. We are assured that the, the Messiah is coming at some point in the future. But we all know that in the case of the real Messiah, you know, he's still 2,020 years late. So... If, if there is going to be something coming down the line and we are asked to believe in it, let's at least know what it is or have some reassurance that there is something to be faithful for. At the moment, I just don't see that. Uh, and the lack of communication has been my bugbear for the last five years. My biggest criticism of our party, of leader, or the leadership of our party, is that it doesn't talk to the people who they demand votes from. They just expect us to vote for them no matter what they do. That doesn't work that way. You have to back up your actions with deeds and you have to tell people what you're going to do. Until we see the manifesto from the SNP for next year, I don't think we'll have a clue what they're planning to do at all. Um, I, I hear from different people what they believe the SNP's plan is, but actually they're operating just on faith and assumption. And as we, as we know from things like the banking crisis, Donald Trump, Boris Johnson and Brexit, you can't assume things won't happen or assume things will happen. You have to plan for all the eventualities. And at the moment, we're not seeing much sign of that.
Anyway, don't give up. I think things will get better from here on in. They have reached a peak of um, febrile sort of panic at the moment, but it will calm down and we should see these smaller parties that are growing up starting to amalgamate or dropping out of sight so that one party can emerge not victorious, but as the strongest candidate to stand in the list, because that's really what should happen. We should have a bit of Darwinian um, survival of the fittest in the list, and one party, I hope, will emerge from the two that are there at the moment have just formed as the party that we will vote for on the list in order to rid Holyrood of as many Tories as possible. And I say Tories because they are basically the opposition. They, they are the next largest party to the SNP. If we can reduce their vote in the list, we could decimate the numbers at Holyrood and that will make voting on anything to do with independence a hell of a lot quicker and easier. See you later. Bye-bye. Thank you. 